The COVID-19 pandemic has brought to the fore key opportunities for digital technology and data to support health and well-being. But equally, it has amplified key digital and data governance challenges. The past year has seen important discussions about shaping a rights-based approach to digital health, identifying and responding to the digital determinants of health, overcoming the digital divide, and navigating geopolitical, regulatory, and legal barriers to global governance. A number of new initiatives aim to bring together actors in digital health so as to support peer exchange and learning, community engagement and inclusion, and donor alignment. In this panel on global governance and digital cooperation for health, you will hear from five distinguished speakers about how to build communities of practice for digital health and shape policy and practice that supports health for all in a digital world. The speakers are Jason Munyan, Program Officer, Office of the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Technology, Sunita Grothi, Lead UNICEF Ventures, Sky Gilbert, Executive Director of Digital Square, Rudiger Krech, Director of Health Promotion at the UHC Healthier Populations Division at the World Health Organization, and John Fairhurst, Head of Private Sector Engagement at the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. Welcome to our speakers. I'm happy to represent the office of the, the inaugural uh, Envoy on Technology uh, here. Now, the, um, the Secretary General of um, the United Nations, Secretary General Guterres, he has said that two seismic shifts will shape the 21st century, uh, the climate crisis and digital transformation. And so, you know, we've, we've seen uh, this uh, digital issues uh, emerge as, as uh, an, an important area for international cooperation. And a couple of years ago, uh, there was uh, established the Secretary General's high level panel on digital cooperation, co chaired by Jack Ma Gates with about 20 uh, high, level, uh, high level panelists. They looked at what were some of the key um, issues and themes that they saw as areas uh, where there is urgent need uh, for greater, greater cooperation. And so they, they kind of focused in about uh, eight uh, areas. Um, one is global connectivity. Um, and then there's um, um, digital inclusion, uh, digital public goods, um, digital human rights, um, capacity building, uh, trust and security, artificial intelligence, and then the global digital cooperation architecture, kind of what are some of the frameworks or uh, or bodies or forums that we have to, to bring different stakeholders together. Then when, after they issued their report in 2019, then uh, there were several uh, consultations, virtual roundtables uh, along these different uh, lines. And uh, our team worked on, uh, on preparing the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation, which looked at the report of the high level panel and, uh, and also the inputs uh, from a range of stakeholders in different areas, and, and then set forth the Secretary General's vision of how the United Nations uh, system should address these, uh, these inputs uh, and uh, what, what next steps we should take. And so it outlines a series of recommendations along these different areas. And when we were um, drafting uh, this report, um, you know, it, New York was one of the epicenters of the, the COVID pandemic. You know, we really started writing in March and April and uh, there were a lot of cases, you know, nobody knew uh, where, where to get tested. I mean, there was a lot of unknowns about uh, the virus at that time. And so, so that really um, influenced, you can see when you read the roadmap, um, there's that context uh, there because the, the COVID pandemic really underscores uh, these different lines. So one is, is connectivity. You know, we, we've, we've, you know, one of the things that we've seen over this past year is more people taking advantage of telehealth and you know, consulting with doctors through apps or online. 
uh, and that is hoped that that's a means of granting access to healthcare in rural areas or areas where um, they may not have access to clinics or hospitals or doctors. But in rural areas, we also see connectivity challenges. You know, that not only do they have challenges getting access to hospitals, but they have access getting um, internet access. And so um, all these great apps and resources, um, they're not available if they don't have internet access. So we really need to do more in the area of connectivity. And then related to that, that there's digital inclusion. So not just having the digital infrastructure there, but is the content relevant? Is it useful? Is it accessible uh, to different groups? Uh, for example, you know, we've seen recently as vaccines have been rolled out, you know, one of the target populations is, is senior citizens, but senior citizens may not um, be using the internet or may not be familiar with how to access the websites that they need to register and make appointments to, to receive the vaccinations. And so there, that, that really underscores the need uh, for inclusion. Um, when, when the COVID pandemic, uh, you know, when, we, when we saw um, it starting and, and when we saw countries taking different approaches to, uh, to implement contract tracing, then that's where some of the human rights issues uh, were mentioned. You know, countries took different approaches. Uh, one you know, some countries at first tried a centralized approach and human rights uh, activists and civil society organizations and others expressed uh, concerns about privacy and what will be used with data. Um, some countries that uh, said that, you know, the data will only be used uh, for the contract tracing for the pandemic um, have since uh, used uh, data for uh, fighting crime or for other purposes. And, and that's why um, you know, there was the partnership of Google and Apple, you know, to try to take a decentralized approach and, and ways that we can protect uh, privacy. In the area of trust and security, which is in the uh, high level panel report and also in the roadmap, that's something else that we've seen with the pandemic. You know, not, this, this pandemic is a bit different from ones that we've had, you know, decades ago in that doctors and pharmacists and researchers, they aren't just trying to uh, heal patients and to uh, stop the virus itself, but they're having to fend cyber attacks. They're, they're facing ransomware, they're facing uh, misinformation, disinformation, and uh, so they're, they're having to fight uh, the virus um, online as well. And uh, so th it introduces other challenges, even just I think this week or last week in France, there was a, uh, a vaccination center that had to stop administering vaccines because they had ransomware. And so we're really seeing how um, trust and security is, is, is an important issue uh, for healthcare as well. Um, artificial intelligence is one that I think um, highlights some of the, uh, the benefits or opportunities, you know, that uh, in, in researching the vaccines and in researching treatments, we've been able to use artificial intelligence to analyze thousands of, of compounds and, and different uh, enzymes and, and, uh, and, uh, and as for potential candidates uh, for further research. And we've also been able to use um, information communications technologies to communicate, you know, researchers uh, from across continents and uh, countries, and and to really in, encourage collaboration and look at supply chains, look at look at uh, at where the, the the resources and equipment are. So you know that artificial intelligence has been has has shown some opportunities uh, in this area as well. And then in in, in global uh, co cooperation in the architecture. You know, it, it, when we look at the um, Internet Governance Forum and some of these other uh, bodies that exist, um, sometimes these are annual forums, but when the, the COVID um, pandemic started, you know, this happened in between the Global Annual um, Internet Governance Forum. And so we have to look at ways that we can be agile, that we can be responsive as they're emerging um, health issues um, to bring people together. So really, even though the roadmap did not treat healthcare or, or health as a specific theme, you can see how um, these different dimensions and these different recommendations in the roadmap definitely uh, relate um, and they're illustrated in the COVID pandemic. So one of the uh, recommendations that we see in the high level panel report and that is taken up in the roadmap as well is the, uh, the recommendation to designate a envoy in technology. And so this, this position was created um, just a few weeks ago and uh, the appointment was made and uh, this, this envoy the, the hope is that the envoy will serve as a main point of call within the United Nations systems for different actors. So as uh, healthcare researchers or institutions or as uh, private sector companies or others try to 
um, reach the United Nations system or understand um, how to cooperate that the envoy can serve as a means of, of bringing stakeholders together. You know, the, the UN, we have many different departments around the world, many different countries, and it can be very confusing and difficult for people to bring solutions or ideas to the UN system. And so the envoy can serve as a means of connecting these external parties with, with the UN. At the same time, can help uh, uh, support uh, cooperation internally within the UN as well. And one of the things that, that we're encouraged by that we see in the roadmap and that uh, we've already um, pursued as an office is also seeing how we can better leverage the United Nations country teams and the resident coordinators. And so we've already seen how we can uh, integrate connectivity into the development action plans at the country level. And we're also working with, uh, with the, the country teams on um, how they can combat misinformation, how they can um, look at social media content. Um, we've, uh, and so we've, we've asked uh, for resident coordinators to serve as, um, as focal points and to uh, be champions of, um, of some of these uh, digital cooperation issues. And so, so this is an area that we are very encouraged by and that we, as, a, as the office of the Envoy, we're also looking to link them to resources and to uh, capacity building um, so that we can really bring these different parts of the UN system uh, together. So I think those are some of the, the main points um, that we see. We're a brand new office just established. And so I, I welcome any ideas or inputs any of you may have, and especially um, in the area of health, anything that we can do to support you. And, uh, um, I, I know that our colleagues in OHCHR and, and civil society and others are already actively working in different areas that are related. For example, OHCHR is taking the lead in drafting guidance um, for um, uh, content uh, regulation and also guidance on internet shutdowns. You know, an internet shutdown actually is another example of one of these cross-cutting areas that, that when a country um, shuts off access to the internet uh, for an election or if there's a coup or other things that we've seen recently, um, that, that also cuts off people from access to e-health, uh, access to these apps and services. And so that's another dimension that we see. But I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, uh, and pause there and I look forward to the inputs in this, in this conversation. Thank you. So today um, I wanted to share some reflections and concrete examples from the work that's been driven by our team um, at the Office of Innovation at UNICEF. As Lone already mentioned, I lead a team called UNICEF Ventures. Our focus is particularly at looking at how emerging technologies can support the work that UNICEF does. And we are also very honored of co-championing two of the recommendations that Jason mentioned that have been made out of the, came out of the high-level panel and have been outlined in more detail in the, in the SG's roadmap. And that's specifically the one uh, 1A on digital connectivity, which we sometimes to also as SDG zero, um, and the one on digital public goods, 1B. Um, and so while neither of those are, of course, specific to health, we see both of these recommendations as really aiming to address fundamental infrastructure and tools that can accelerate health outcomes. And similarly, the work of our team at UNICEF also is not sector specific, but aims to build digital solutions that underlie, you know, that sort of un address underlying bottlenecks across the mandate of UNICEF, um, and also improve the overall infrastructure and dynamics that ultimately shape how resources flow, how value is generated and captured um, from these kinds of digital solutions um, and the impact that they could have. So today I wanted to share a little bit of our experience from running um, a venture fund out of our team that invests in digital public goods um, and where we've really tried to change the definition of value and returns that are able to be generated from uh, investments in these kinds of solutions and just speak very briefly about our plans um, through the Digital Public Goods Alliance and GIGA, which is an initiative launched together with ITU um, to scale access to connectivity through, through schools and really seeing those two as initiatives or platforms where we're trying to address infrastructural level barriers um, to access to these solutions. So UNICEF Ventures, we have over the last years 
really focused exclusively on building digital solutions as public goods. And on a very practical level, this has meant a few things. Um, it's meant that setting up our innovation fund, which is now at about $30 million, we've invested in, a, in over 100 solutions in over 50 countries, um, very exclusively focusing on those that are placed on open source licenses, not just because we want to increase access and facilitate access to those solutions themselves, but we're also through that have tried to change how we define what value is, how it gets generated and how it can get captured. We speak to the contributors to our fund about value that we, we generate through these investments as defined by and measured through the intellectual property, the open source intellectual property that we're able to contribute to the ecosystem. Um, we've also had partners join us uh, technically and through their expertise in really generating new open source solutions, data and insight. And for those of you particularly that are operating within the UN system, this is actually, uh, you'll understand that this can at times actually require quite a big um, administrative shift, let's say, internally in terms of how we collaborate, what kind of agreements are, are able to, uh, we're able to use. And also we've seen now that through this work, we've actually as an institution and have been able to make that available across the UN system, actually devise these kinds of agreements, the kinds of modalities that we need as the UN system to engage public and private partners in new ways so that we can together generate solutions and insights, tools that can be considered digital public goods and can be made available and accessible. And here, I think just to kind of state the obvious, but what's important here is that we're not just making available as digital public goods, the solutions themselves, but actually the value that can be generated and captured through the solutions. So by making them, placing them on open source licenses, we can see that local players, local stakeholders, local ecosystems are able to pick up solutions and are actually able to generate value and capture that value in country, as opposed to being dependent and tied into external structures that might be otherwise considered the unique project owners um, of particular solutions and, and related infrastructure. So in this context and really building on that experience, we we're extremely pleased to see that Secretary General in his roadmap adopt a very clear definition of digital public goods that define them explicitly as open source software, open data, open AI models, standard and content. Um, in, the, in partnership with the government of Norway, Sierra Leone and iSpirit, UNICEF founded then the Digital Public Goods Alliance, um, and which aims explicitly at identifying, supporting and scaling open source solutions. So specifically uh, in relationship to health, and I'm really pleased to see um, Dickie and Sky as part of this panel here, we've been very fortunate to have the support of UNICEF's health team, WHO, PATH and Digital Square in coming together as a sort of initial advisory group for a community of practice that is focused on digital health. And while this may seem as kind of a small initial step, some of the really um, encouraging collaboration we've seen so far is the willingness to align behind common definitions of what digital goods and digital public goods are, what they mean for health, what the common ones are that are very mature, that are ready for scale. And then on the flip side, ultimately also defining where the gaps are, where more investment might be needed in future, specifically looking at the next generation that would be leveraging frontier technologies and emerging technologies. And what we all as players that on one hand might be putting financial or political resources into this space, um, how we can actually align and drive, drive movement into that space together. Secondly, uh, looking a little bit of our team's work at, at fundamentally changing access to digital solutions, part of the work of the Digital Public Goods Alliance is a vision that we have to create um, sort of a trusted internet that's populated with safe and va va valuable digital solutions. And here we could, this is still very much a vision, but we could imagine the creation of, for instance, a designated top level domain that provides this joint access point and joint identity for new solutions that makes them more discoverable and more easily accessible, but also includes a sort of brand recognition for, for those solutions that have already been verified as digital public goods. And I think here very important and coming back to this discussion around governance is also the transparency of data and actually the vetting process that um, highlights and recommends certain solutions over others. What are the weaknesses? What are the strengths? What are the particular considerations that maybe deploying governments might have to take into account as they use solutions? 
And so here we're really looking forward to kind of exploring that with some of the partners um, who have the ability to set up these top level domains to see how we can create um, this new kind of platform that not only provides solutions, but also potentially provides a solution to where value and data points can be exchanged directly and freely uh, between solutions and their users. And finally, addressing kind of the fundamental, again, kind of SDG zero barrier to access when we think of digital solutions, connectivity. Um, and Jason's already spoken a little bit about the importance of access to connectivity across the board. Um, we were delighted also to see the SG uh, call out GIGA, an initiative that's been launched together with ITU in 2019. And while the focus at GIGA takes, it's very much on looking at schools as the entry point for connectivity, the aim of GIGA is to deliver um, con uh, access to affordable connectivity to communities as a whole. Um, and so where what we're really excited here to, to see over the last only year and a half, almost two years, is that 15 countries are now actively implementing um, GIGA, identifying connectivity needs. And here again, we're really looking at changing the way in which resources have been flowing and looking at new systems for accountability. The mapping platform that underpins GIGA um, currently uses machine learning, among other tools, to map school location and connectivity status in real time. To date, 800,000 schools have been mapped in 30 countries and growing by the day. We've already seen how, for instance, in Kyrgyzstan, um, the government has been able to use that real-time map to renegotiate contracts with provide a rate um, for school and for school connectivity and thereby, thereby saving very valuable resources. So in summary, we really find that the new roadmap, um, as Jason outlined already, provides a unique opportunity and global platform to revisit and revitalize efforts, not just in making solutions and digital health solutions more accessible, but actually trying to, to challenge and change some of the fundamental structures of resource flows and value generation and capture that may have in the past been barriers to scaling, but that we could, if unlocked, um, really use to, to further accelerate efforts and access. Thank you, Ilona. Our vision uh, at the very heart of what we try to do is, is build a world where appropriate use of digitally enabled health services closes the health equity gap. And this vision has a couple of really key important points here. Uh, the term digitally enabled health services actually comes from the UN panel on digital cooperation, where it was first coined. And it was listed as a priority of getting digitally and health, enabled health services available to many. And so we wanted to convey our commitment to honoring that vision uh, by making it part of ours. And then in terms of orienting towards closing the health equity gap, I think in Iona's opening remarks, she made the really important point that uh, when a world where we still have a digital divide there's a risk that if we aren't thoughtful and responsible about how we pursue digital transformation, that will actually make health equity worse rather than better and create a world of haves and have nots in terms of access. And so we really wanna make sure that the things we do are in service of, of digital as a tool for, for making things better in terms of health equity and closing that gap. And it's not as easy as it sounds given there are so many people that still remain excluded from digital platforms. Uh, our mission is to connect health leaders with the resources necessary for digital transformation. So uh, in that connecting with health leaders, we're really putting health leaders in communities, in countries, front and center of who we want to serve, though we do support and partner with many different kinds of stakeholders. And the kinds of resources we connect them to are varied, uh, and it really depends on need. So, uh, it could be financial resources, it could be guidance and documents, uh, connections to peers if they want to have peer learning opportunities. Uh, so there's lots of different kinds of things that could support health leaders that want to pursue digital transformation. Uh, we have three specific problem areas that we, that we spend a lot of time trying to focus on, uh, and each of them have elements of cooperation uh, in them. So the first is that uh, a lot of um, health leaders want more information, knowledge, and skills around digital health. Uh, and those demands that, we're, that we hear in our work aren't always met by currently available 
learning opportunities. And, and when you don't meet those learning needs, uh, you have people wanting to learn who can't learn, you have misalignment around how to pursue digital transformation of health systems. And so it can have consequences for getting to that place where you're doing really thoughtful, deliver, deliberate, responsible digital transformation. Uh, so we, um, what we do here is we really focus on supporting country leadership and we support specifically uh, digital health governing bodies and their learning objectives. And one recent example of this is, uh, and actually it's great to see Derek Munene from WHO on the line because we worked on this uh, together, um, is that we, uh, coming out of a Wilton Park meeting a few years ago, a number of actors conceived of this idea of a digital health applied leadership program. Uh, and this program has um, a couple of components to it that are different and meet some of the demands that we were hearing. Um, one is instead of training individuals, it trains teams of governing bodies so that they're learning together. Uh, uh, and then when they go back to their institutions, they can support each other in making changes. Uh, two is that it um, pulls in coaching as a key part. Uh, three, it connects them to peer learning networks. And then the fourth thing that is a little bit unique about it is that it links a uh, traditional curriculum that is delivered to them with an applied project that is related to digital health. So for example, uh, one of the inaugural cohorts will come from the Democratic Republic of Congo and their applied project will be taking their digital health strategy and translating it into an investment roadmap. So um, this project uh, is administered, uh, we just announced by the University of Global Health Equity. So we're really excited about that partnership. And, uh, and that's an example of how we're supporting uh, health leaders. Um, and governing bodies. Uh, I think another place where we really try to support the community um, is where uh, Sunita was speaking to is really supporting the scale of digital health innovations beyond pilot stage. Um, we've seen to date inadequate investment in that area uh, and, and really want to support the maturation of these products so that they're scalable, affordable, able to be deployed in a lot of different places. And, um, and so if we think about the broad umbrella of digital public goods, the many that um, the DPGA and, and UNICEF have invested in, uh, think of where we focus is um, across all the sectors. We focus very much on the, on the health, the ones that serve specifically health, and then we focus on later stage innovation. Uh, and we, uh, through our nomenclature, uh, call them global goods, so it's a subset. Uh, with these, um, one thing we've been doing is uh, doing a lot of iterations on the governance of how we disperse funds to support these global goods. So um, we actually don't make directly make decisions about where the global good, which global goods are supported. Uh, the global goods apply and then they, their applications are evaluated first by each other in an open collaborative process and then by a peer review committee that is comprised of experts from throughout the world. Uh, and then eventually it goes to our board, which has representatives from government, the UN, elsewhere to make a final decision. And so uh, we wanted a transparent, inclusive process um, and one that fostered collaboration across the innovators so that they could, uh, they could connect and form stronger relationships with each other. That's particularly important for investments like interoperability, where you're really needing people to work together uh, across products in order to exchange information. Um, so uh, we, um, since we, since inception, uh, we have start, we have supported 33 global goods with 58 awards. Uh, these global goods, like I said, are, are pretty mature. So we have 71 countries that are currently using two or more of the global goods, uh, and about 20 are using six or more. Um, and, and the reason you use so many is that some are for supply chain, some are for health workforce. And, and so, um, and then in terms of our investments, about half of our investments that we've made have concluded. And from those, we have 15 of those products are now interoperable, whereas they weren't before. Uh, and then 16 have also advanced on, uh, on their own product maturity. So technical, robustness uh, and, and governance models. And um, yeah, so, uh, so that's the global goods that we support uh, and to really try to improve availability of supply for countries. 
And then our third area is we don't, um, we also don't see uh, yet, um, we're seeing great progress on alignment of actors pursuing digital transformation. Uh, but we still see a lot of people with different perspectives about what is a good investment, about where to focus. And so we do uh, some research and evidence generation to try to bring people aligned around a common evidence base, or we'll do convening of investors to support. And so we have uh, about 15 uh, investors that have supported Digital Square and uh, we meet with them on monthly learning connects where we share information and uh, try to really focus on topics where we've seen some misalignment and try to bring folks together. Um, so those are just a few ways to collab that we collaborate together. I think that the one thing I'll say is with COVID-19, we're seeing a lot of shifts in what people want from digital transformation of health systems. Uh, and, um, and I think we're seeing more urgency we're seeing a lot of folks wanting more digital, but also very limited bandwidth. And so I just wanted to close with a quote um, from the Senegal uh, Ministry of Health. Uh, so um, the quote is, during a new crisis, we're so happy to be able to use existing tools with just new functionalities. It's avoiding us to be overwhelmed and are confused with a new tool again. Please consider our time load. Uh, so I thought that was a really pragmatic and grounding way to conclude our talk of digital transformation. Thank you. Um, at the moment where physical distancing is crucial, digital has flourished. Millions of people rely on their digital devices to get up-to-date public health information, statistics, and services. Yet access remains a barrier for many. Even for those who have access, information quality and accuracy is a challenge. Many countries have tried to avoid disruption to their inpatient services during COVID by relying on telemedicine, remote support and consultations through digital. Digital has been at the forefront of mass health data collection efforts on COVID cases, and it is an integral part of the development of vaccines. Digital stock inventories have helped procure and gain access to equipment like PPE, and WH Augmented Reality app is helping teach health workers learn how to don PPEs and ensure infection prevention and control. WHO has developed the world's first digital health worker, Florence. Uh, so if you want to quit smoking, she's excellent to help you with that. And WHO and the UN have been working with private tech companies, fellow, fellow UN agencies, governments and NGOs to, prov pro to provide validated, um, uh, reliable digital information. At WHO, digital has enabled us to continue to work through Zoom like this one and to connect and coordinate with our member states and their populations throughout the pandemic. In many ways, digital has been at the heart of the global COVID response. Nevertheless, we have also witnessed some spectacular digital failures during COVID, particularly around digital tools for tracking and tracing. The digital data produced is not always reliable. Digital products and services for COVID remain unused due to low demand or poor experience by end users. And of course, in many countries, there are still significant groups who are completely untouched by the digital world. We have also witnessed examples during COVID where digital has absolutely not been used for good. An example of violence towards kids and women, which is just the tip of the iceberg. Ethicists would argue that digital health technology is a good example of the dual use dilemma. It can be used for good, and it can be used and also misused through unuse, creating deliberate or unintentional negative effects. How do we solve this ethical and digital dilemma? The answer is that we cannot solve it entirely, but we can mitigate some of the negative consequences through carefully designed programs, partnerships, and regulatory frameworks. You may consider this emerging need for regulatory frameworks when finalizing your commission's report. 
Now, why am I telling you all these recent experience COVID? Because it ex exemplifies how digital is already changing our lives. When listening to the tech experts, it is clear that innovation cycles gain in speed. What took about 15 years in the 1990s takes five years today, and it might only take three years, 10 years time. This is why increasingly all our daily lives will be influenced by digital. And with this, our health and well-being. We need to bear this in mind when designing our strategies for health of the future. So instead of just taking digital innovation as a given, we should ask much more for what? Test the potential impact of digital innovation on well-being, and then regulate so to endure uh, it, it really to ensure it really does. So I think that is at this at the core and center of your discussion in this commission, and I'm we are at WHO very very happy to uh, be uh, with you in designing that and and uh, finalizing your. The 2018 WHO Digital Health Resolution has already recognized the importance of collaboration in digital health. WHO has enjoyed a long collaboration with the UN on digital, and we have many of the colleagues here with us today, and especially so with our sister agencies in ITU, ISO, and UNICEF, uh, and of course the UN Sec uh, Secretary General, and with our academic collaborating centers. WHO supports broad multi-stakeholder alliances and collaborations for cooperation and for regulation of digital health. We have less experience in WHO on collaborating directly with the private sector. We are, of course, always concerned with the influence of profit. However, our COVID experience, where we have worked with a lot of tech companies, has shown us that we have, in fact, very good alignment with them on our core values towards health. They, like us, want to ensure a healthy world. All have been committed to the cause. COVID is bigger than all of us, and we have seen some remarkable partnerships and collaborations formed during the last year. One of the COVID tech partnerships on Chatbox is a great example of this. In an attempt to ensure mass access, WHO worked with all the most common chatbot, com chatbot companies, including WhatsApp and Viber. We also worked with chatbots like uh, Free Basics that do not require internet access. The chatbot bots have purposefully been launched in as many languages as possible. The benefit of these chatbots is that agreements do not need to be made at country level with providers. Thanks to WHO's global, global agreements with the tech sector, hypothetically, everyone in the world can access these spots as a global tool. Of course, it would be naive of us to assume that all populations are able to access our WHO chat box and bots in practice. Mobile phone access is high in almost all parts of the world, but internet access remains low. There are still important groups that are completely le left behind. These often intersect with those who are already vulnerable to being left behind in health and economic development, such as women, migrants, refugees, internally displaced persons, older persons, young people, children, persons with disabilities, rural populations, and indigenous peoples. We are also acutely aware that during COVID, digital has exacerbated many of the social and economic determinants of health. We have seen growing gaps in educational achievements between children who have and do not have access to devices um, for online learning. There is also good evidence that with online education, kids have left, led increasingly sedentary lives. The link between increased screen time and poor mental health is well established for children and adolescents. In the UK, there is some indication that children have been increasingly exposed to online junk food adverts during the pandemic, thanks to increased time spent online. This is part of the reason that the country announced plans for a total online ban of junk food advertising in November 2020. In a sense, access to digital is becoming a determinant of health in its own right. In addition, we have seen digital facilitate the spread of something that is almost 
as dangerous as the COVID virus itself. And that's false information about COVID. This arguably spreads even quicker than the virus. The false information also exacerbates inequalities because it disproportionately affects certain groups and undermines their trust in public health interventions or vaccination, leaving them more vulnerable to the virus. The infodemic is particularly strong within population groups that have been traditionally marginalized. Since the very first COVID myth appeared, WHO has been work, working hard to tackle the infodemic by improving access to verified information through as many digital channels, languages, and content as possible. WHO has also been using artificial intelligence to capture online conversations to see where false information is spreading or where there are online information voids. We then work with the big tech companies to pull down false information. Other ethical considerations on digital health are more typical ones. They include informed consent, data ownership, data collection, storage and use, data set bias, and issues of privacy. Governance frameworks for digital health must consider these ethical and equitable challenges. They should also support regulations, coordination, accountability, and appropriate standards for safety, security, privacy, and interoperability. Governance should also ensure that the benefits of digital health outweigh the risks and are shared evenly within and between countries. You may well be wondering, as a traditional public health agency, what can WHO do to resolve some of these issues? WHO will continue to use our World Health Assembly as a governance forum for consensus building around digital health, sharing experiences and promoting norms and standards relevant to digital health. Private companies and NGOs can contribute as non-state actors. We will also continue to support low and middle income countries who often lack the regulatory knowledge and skills to deal with digital health. We will also work with to reduce the digital divide instead of widening it. Populations or group, uh, groups left behind can be brought into governance discussions. This can be achieved through better understanding their needs or through ensuring that their environment is supportive and conducive to digital. Training, literacy, affordability, access to equipment and tools, connectivity and bandwidth are all relevant here. However, access to digital in and of itself must also be considered. Creating services that are digital by default risks preventing some groups from accessing these services and thereby exacerbating inequalities. Digital and non-digital options should be considered based on the end user resources and preferences. Finally, we must remember that digital is a means to an end. It is not the end in or of itself. A weak public health service or idea will still be weak, even if it is digitalized. It is by no means always the solution to increasing access to health services. We need to ensure that health services are being delivered in ways that make them accessible to everyone. Those services must meet people's specific needs whilst not exposing them to additional risks for their health or personal security. WHO's role will be to act as a digital guardian of these rights to ensure that in our quest for universal health coverage, digital remains an ally and not a foe. And thank you and back to you. And you know, the Global Fund is clearly focused on countries uh, and, and what's uh, happening and how do we support countries in their digital transformation? Uh, obviously, mostly low middle income countries. Um, so I've picked up on a few points people have made already. I, I, I mean, I think the key thing is it, it's very clear there's a huge strain on the countries um, at the moment. Uh, and, and I think the point Sky made about um, 
leveraging existing technology, leveraging existing platforms and evolving those to be more successful uh, it is a really important one. I think the second thing is that, you know, what COVID has done is, is, is really bring a sense of what's possible. Uh, uh, and I think this is going to be a, a different pace of digital transformation as we move forward. Um, the, the Minister of Health, Reed Opia, said the other day that, you know, they've now realised that daily health information is actually possible. They get that for COVID. It takes three months to get the malaria testing information in general and even longer to get TB. Um, so there's a sense of, you know, we've been accepting digital structures and digital timelines, which are not uh, not not restrained by our technology and our capability. Uh, they're, they're constrained by our willingness and our inputs to, to make it. Um, now, all of that means, as everybody has said before, that you know it's not just about what we do; it's about how we do it. Um, it is really fundamental. Um, and and this point of equity, I think, is is obviously absolutely central to driving impact in low and middle income countries. You know, both at a national level, at a global level, in terms of how technology and resources are available, um, but obviously at the national level in terms of how equity of access um, you know, plays within the country. And, and I think it's fair to say that the, the current context of the world is not, um, is not a great case study for equity um, in terms of allocating resources uh, when we look at some of the COVID resources uh, and, and, and access to vaccines. So I, I, I think it's, it's absolutely central that we, we focus in that space. Um, the, the second thing I'd say is, you know, we, everyone's talked about collaboration. Of course, I, I you know, it, it's fundamental that there are so many dimensions of collaboration. There's the global collaboration around uh, building global goods, um, uh, around aligning donors to you know, reduce the fragmentation. Um, I, I think the point um, that really good just made, though, well, is, is one thing we don't often talk about is integration. That digital itself, if it's not integrated into a health system effectively, um, will not be effective. And I think mean, we've all seen the failure of digital systems um, because the, the people um, and the supply chains and the, the component parts that need to align with the digital transformation are, are not transforming in the same way. Um, and so one of the things that the Global Fund does very seriously is make sure digital transformation is embedded in health system strengthening, that the two need to go hand in hand as we, um, we build success. Um, the other thing to say is if you look across many of the countries, there's been tremendous progress in, 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 in many of, of the last years. Uh, in the Global Fund world, uh, nearly 97% of, of the sort of high burden countries where we work have digital data now at facility level. Um, that, that doesn't mean that the quality of the data is there and there are many other parts of the system that are not working as effectively as it could be, but th there's been a huge um, shift and there's a huge momentum in many countries now to, to, to drive that digital transformation um, as well. Um, which leads me to the next point, which is really central to the Global Fund is, um, we often don't talk about the, the country ownership and the country leadership around this agenda. And I think that the translation between the global conversation and the national conversation is also not a, uh, a straightforward uh, 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 endeavor as well. So, you know, we, we need country ownership, we need country leadership if these, this transformation is to actually turn into real change and to create equity for, for people in the country. Um, and so it's really important there that we have this collaboration and coordination um, at that level. And that's a, it's a fundamental tenant of the Global Funds that, you know, everything we do is led by countries. Um, that doesn't mean there doesn't need to be a, an engagement and an influencing and, and bringing uh, knowledge and learning from other countries in order to create um, change is important. Um, the other thing that's linked to that, I think, is is the role of civil society in this conversation. And this, was, I think, was one of the questions on the chat. Um, and I, I think we, I mean, this is something we feel very centrally in the Global Fund because of the, a, the role we have of civil civil society in our structure, but but also the. Um, the, the, the risks, if you like, in terms of the, the, the sort of data transformation for many of the populations that we work with. So, you know, in many countries, the, the populations affected by HIV are criminalized populations. Their use and access to data and the security of the data that is there is obviously a fundamental concern to, to them. 
uh, as a population, I mean, as it is from people, many other people for other reasons. Um, and, I, and I think we need to make sure that in building this agenda, we, we do have the private sector at the table, we do have the public sector at the table, but it's, it's really important that civil society is part of um, the context of looking at issues like privacy and security and equity, of course, uh, it's a really central piece of the, the conversation. Um, so just to finish, because I know we're running short of time, to give a sense of to what does that mean practically in terms of how um, we drive this agenda. Our, our key concern clearly is how do we mobilize resources um, to support countries to create digital transformation um, in, in health, digital health transformation. Um, and how do we mobilize it in a way that both accelerates the, um, the added value uh, of this, but also is doing it in the right way, you know, is making sure those resources get deployed in a context that deals with many of the issues that people have raised. So one of the things we've been doing is, is working on a, a platform um, that has a number of, I think, interesting sort of components. Um, it's, it's been supported by Rockefeller uh, uh, as, a, as a starting point. What one of the focus points is, is looking at building digital, um, the digital information at the last mile to really focusing on the, the community health uh, side and uh, of the health system. And that's fundamentally because if you look at most countries, certainly low middle income countries, the health burden is largely in, um, in the rural areas in the, in the last mile of the health system. And, and historically much of the digital investment, much of the health investment um, has actually been made in urban settings and not focused on, on transforming that part of the, 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 uh, the system. Um, the second thing it does is look to mobilize a, a, a cross-sector consortium to, to mobilize resources. Because one of the things we believe is money will not solve the challenge. We need money aligned with, with technical capabilities, these transformational capabilities that um, Rudiger was talking about from the private sector that allow us to move to sort of next generation sort of frontier technologies faster. Um, and for many of these countries to leapfrog, we need those technologies to be deployed appropriately. Um, you know, in looking at the concerns around privacy and security and, and national ownership. And that means you need a platform, which is really a cross-sectoral platform that has private sector capabilities uh, embedded in it. It has civil society as a key actor in, in advising the approach and the strategy and, and developing the, the frameworks around how it gets implemented. And of course, it has national government uh, involved and obviously funding, ideally. So that's a platform we've been building around this Rockefeller program, which is really looking to change the investment in, in data transformation and make sure the balance of it is, is directly addressing this equity problem, making sure that we're addressing it at the last mile of the, the health system, not, not only the, the first mile as well. Um, we're also working with an organization called Transform Health, which I know Vicky and, uh, and Sky and many others uh, work on. Um, which is an organization which is trying to bring um, uh, a strong civil society and, and particularly youth uh, engagement in, into this uh, space. Um, because I think it's really important that as we move forward, this, this is actually informed by, you know, the people on the ground and, and obviously young people um, are going to be the, the future um, as we develop this. Uh, and so that's very core, I think, to making sure that that voice is, is part of the platforms. But I think these platforms, as we move from the global level setting, the global goods and the global policy that we've talked about a lot on this call, there is this need to then actually be able to translate that into the, the right support and the right action that accelerates this agenda in the countries uh, in the right way. And, and I think that's really where the Global Fund is, is focused. Thanks very much.